Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, and as always, I will be your uh, conductor through this hour of discussion and talk. And today, we have a fascinating topic, and one that has been uh, in the news, but not really in people's attention, I think, a lot. And that's the issue of foster youth, and especially LGBTQ foster youth. And today, I'm very, very pleased to have as my guests two former foster youth and a woman who works with these young people um, really talking about the issue working with foster youth uh, in the state of California, but I'm sure if you're watching from another state, you might have exactly the same kind of program. So I'd like you to help me welcome my guests. Uh, this is Teron Barnes, and he is a former foster youth who's now getting his master's at the University of Southern California, which is okay, I'm a Bruin, but it's all right. <laughs> I'm happy uh, to have you do that. And also, Teron has been an advocate uh, on the issue of uh, foster kids, especially for the California Youth Connection, which I saw in Sacramento testifying uh, in front of us on issues, but of course the work is broader than that. So welcome, Teron. Thank you. Go Very you glad you're me. here. Uh, my second guest is Maggie Toison, and Maggie is also a former- very French. Did it, good. <laughs> uh, Maggie's also a former foster youth, uh, aged out, as we say, and is currently studying at the University of Alaska in Anchorage, um, also has done some advocacy on behalf of foster youth, and I think is participating in a program as a volunteer in Alaska called Facing Foster Care in Alaska. So welcome, thank you so much, Maggie, for doing this. Thank you. And our third guest today is Jackie Lindemann, and Jackie's the Director of Development for California Youth Connection, uh, and we'll hear a good deal, I hope, about that organization and about your own work, Jackie. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, Teron, let's start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story um, in the foster care system or in foster care. Kind of what, what, what happened to you as a kid? Well, um, I actually entered foster care when I was eight. Um, and it was prompted by, you know, a little bit of abuse from my mom and um, my mom and dad not being able to get along. And so um, I was born in Sacramento and we moved here when I was seven to kind of get away from the abuse, um, me, my mother and my younger sister. And she was a newborn at the time. Mm -hmm. And so um, my dad had been, went to prison. We moved to, Sac to LA from Sacramento and um, Within a year, my mom became more abusive and just wasn't able to deal with, you know, raising us alone and without support. So we entered care and we ended up living with my uh, maternal great uncle and his wife and family and they had a family of their own. They had eight children um, amongst themselves. And so then they added me and my younger sister. Wow. So yeah, it was more than the Brady Bunch. But um, <laughs> we moved with them and I was basically raised with my aunt and uncle up until I was a uh, freshman in high school. And I, you know, I had longed for a connection with my biological family, um, my siblings that I wasn't raised with. I really wanted to get to know them. So I ended up moving back to Sacramento with my maternal um, grandmother. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother was mo moved to Texas and in rehab at the time. Mm -hmm. And so um, I got reconnected with my family. My biological father was out of prison um, and had, you know, more children and just raised his own family all those years. So um, sophomore and junior year of high school, I lived in Sacramento, got to know my family there um, and really kind of it confirmed the reason why I entered foster care. Still, was the family was unstable, not really, um, didn't feel like a, a connection really with anyone. So then I ended up moving back to LA and um, lived with my aunt and uncle again until I was like 19. And so when then when I emancipated, um, I lived with them, had to pay rent to live there, mm. and I um, was living there basically until it was a point where I couldn't pay rent. It was either pay for my car to be repaired, um, which got me to college and to work, or to pay rent, and I chose to pay to um, take care of myself, and I ended up having to leave. So, so in did you have to go through the court to be like sent to your relatives, or was mm -hmm. it more of a private kind of here you taking for a while kind of thing? Initially, it was amongst the family. Um, it was actually an aunt first that took me in, but then um, within a couple of months, my uncle found out that we can get support from the state. And so mm -hmm. then it was through the courts and it took a couple months for that. 
So what was that like for you? Um, initially, I, you know, I didn't understand it because me and my mom, when we moved from, Sacra from Sacramento, we lived with the uncle. So it was just living in his house was still the same. But then when my mom had to leave and, you know, I didn't see her for days, I was wondering, like, why? Where's my mom? Mm -hmm. You know, and I understood that, you know, she would yell at me and hit me sometimes. And I didn't like it, but I didn't want her to go away. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I went to court, it was just a bunch of strangers. So it was, you know scared I didn't know what was going on and they told me my mom was gonna go to get help and I wouldn't see her and that kind of freaked me out as a kid um, but they said I would have visitation with her you know periodically so that helped but um, initially I just I wasn't understanding it and my parents and my family wasn't explaining anything to me it was more of all the social ser services and all the people that worked there were explaining it to me but I felt like my family should have done that right well and in addition I mean I I think you identify as gay now, mm -hmm. but as a kid, did you have a sense that, I mean, that would add sort of a, mm -hmm. a yet another dimension, really, to definitely. what you were going through, right? Yeah, definitely. I knew I was gay as a kid, and um, my uncle, in fact, was a pastor, assistant pastor of a church, so um, not mm. only was it the pressure for me to be the perfect child, but um, it's like the worst sin for you as a, a boy of a pastor's son to be gay. And so I definitely knew that I could not ever, you know, come out. And um, that was part of the reason why I came out so late, because I didn't come out till I was 25. Mm -hmm. um, and um, all my family actually would say, you know, I was had feminine tendencies and things like that when I was growing up and always felt like I, you know, had these traits that were they can consider gay. Um, and but at the same time, they would say it's my decision and my choice to be gay. So I would always come back with the response of if I was gay and you thought I had these tendencies when I was a kid, is that was that taught to me or did mm -hmm. I have a choice when I didn't know what sexual, sexuality was as a kid? And um, they don't have a response for that. So, so did you ever talk to your family about it? Yeah. Um, but not or not till after you were. Yeah, not until I was twenty five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, it was like actually a year before my my foster dad died too because I, I wanted to have a conversation with him about it but um he actually died when he was on a, a mission trip to africa so i didn't have a chance to talk to him about it and come out to him but to his wife and all my siblings um i came out to them and um everyone you know just thought it was my choice and they were accepting whatever decision i made and um, to this day, they're very supportive. It's just been a process for them to see, you know, who I am because they were scared that I would change to be a different person. Sure. And have you known other uh, gay or lesbian kids that are in the system? Oh, definitely. Yeah. So I currently work at Orangewood Children's Foundation in Orange County. Uh -huh. And um, I work with youth that are from varying backgrounds. And um, we have an increasing number of youth that are coming out um, to us, you know, on a Coming out to you as a, as a case worker. Yeah, and as a peer mentor. Um, uh -huh. And I've just seen a progression of youth having a safe space to come to. So they come to me and other staff to talk about, you know, their being gay or lesbian or having people that they know that are gay and lesbian. And are these kids in foster care? Um, they're both in foster care and some are emancipated. Most of them are emancipated, though. So I imagine that people watching the show I know very little about being in foster care. Okay. Um, you know, we see a little bit about it on, you know, television shows and mm -hmm. whatever. And it seems like there's a, a lot of moving around, a lot of mm -hmm. different families that people live with. It must mm -hmm. be difficult anyway. But I, I, I think we imagine too that it would be even more difficult mm -hmm. because you'd have to hide your secret from everybody. Mm -hmm. And even if you came out to somebody you went somewhere else, you'd be back in the closet again. Mm -hmm. Do you find that with the kids? Yeah, um, and even with my own experience, I remember um, part of the process of me not wanting to come out to my family is because, you know, if my family didn't accept it and then society doesn't ex accept it, then who am I going to be safe with if I tell them this um, when I know that this is an issue that most people don't, you know, accept or acknowledge. And um, with the youth that I talk to, usually they say the same things. It's like they come to our center to talk to us about it or they say it to, you know, certain people in confidence because they know that it's safe with them. Right. and that can help them in their process of you know coming out this issue of safety maggie must be a big one for i mean all it's a big issue for all kids got to have a safe place school's not safe home's not safe or whatever but i saw you nodding when jerron was was talking um t tell us a little bit about 
yourself and your story or, or anything you want to start with? Um, well, I, I entered the foster care system kind of late. Um, I was 15 when I entered the foster care system. And at that time, I wasn't, um, I didn't know I could be a lesbian. I didn't know that. Um, oh. It wasn't a possibility to me. Um, because if I, if, I mean, me and my family never talked about what it means to be a lesbian we, or anything. Um, but when I entered foster care, uh, the first was a foster home. And I couldn't really get used to the family structure. And so I went back with my mother, actually. And then uh, my child welfare worker was just like, well, if you're not used to a family structure, why not try out a group home? Hmm. And so <clears throat> I entered a group home. And when I got there, I saw another girl with her head shaved. Well, not another girl, because at that time, I, my hair was still long and a ponytail like a tomboy. Uh -huh. um, and I saw her, and she had her head shaved like a boy. And I was like, wow, that is so brave. Like, how do you, how does one do that, have the courage to just be who they are? And so I, I came out as, as, as bisexual first, because that was safe um, for me. And then one night, um, I had cut my hair, probably a little too short, and so I couldn't ponytail it anymore. Some things were just like falling out. And so I just one night I was just like, you know what, just cut it off. Mm -hmm. And I just cut it off. And so it was like 2 a.m. and I'm in a group home, and I got the clippers, I got the scissors, you know, and I'm in my bathroom, just cutting my hair. Um, we don't have no clippers, and so there was just clumps, right? And it's like three o'clock in the morning by this time, four o'clock in the morning or something. And I'm like, I can't fix this anymore, you know? So I'm just gonna go to sleep with it. And I wake up the next morning and I'm knocking on the staff door, you know, 7 a.m. And I'm like, I need my hair allowance. Um, <laughs> and she says, but you already had your hair, hair allowance. And I'm like, yeah, but this is an emergency. Um, and she's like, yeah, why is your beanie on? Mm. And what did you do? I'm like, okay. I cut my hair. She's like, oh, yeah, you need a haircut. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I went to go get my haircut. And I can remember um, after I got my haircut, just like how it is now. I remember uh, walking by all the cars, walking home back to the group home. And I'm like, wow, look at me. Look at me. This is my real self, you know, in every car window, you know. And I got back to the group home. And... Um, just talked about it like so what does this mean well it means I like girls <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what um, was the response how many kids in the group home there were six uh -huh. including me so it's including pretty myself. intimate like a family really I mean well, yeah I don't mean we do. Are a family, yeah but I mean you know it's well, like yeah it is not a yeah. huge place so definitely um it it was really supportive actually it wasn't like judging you like why did you do this like oh my god people are gonna judge you know it was really just like processing it with me, you know, um, letting me know that I was fine, you know, just wanting to know if I was fine um, and if I was in crisis or something. I'm like, no, I'm not in crisis. I just came out. <laughs> this is how I'm coming out, <laughs> you know. Um, so it sounds like I wouldn't ever use the word easy about coming out, but it sounds like it was a safe environment. It, it did feel safe to me because other youth around me were expressing themselves. Um, I had a right to be who I was and be supported. Uh, and I knew that whoever I was, those group home staff had to accept me. Uh, and that wasn't so with my family. Mm -hmm. You know, if I came out to my family and would have said this to them, if they didn't accept it, well, then I had no one, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but in the system, I felt safe. It's interesting because it's not the impression that people would have. I mean, the idea of a group home, uh, I. I don't know that people think of it as a safe environment. And maybe some of them aren't. Have you seen others? Oh yeah, I I'm I you know, I stayed at that one particular group home for like 2 years. And I couldn't really appreciate how good I had it until I saw what other group homes were going through. And so I I had a need to actually, you know, um, experience another group home, so I was in respite care, so I went to a second foster home. Mhm. Mm mm -hmm. And I, w I moved around to different group homes. I went to Glass House in Oakland. 
um, and that worked out for a while. And I moved out to different, just different group homes. I, I moved around like six times in mm. six months or something crazy like that. Um, Were you out at all the places? Yeah. Yes. Yes. What the respite care? Um, I went there before I even cut off my hair. Do you want to say what that is? Respite care, it's kind of like babysitting, mm -hmm. foster care babysit, you know, mm -hmm. like if your group home is having too much trouble with you or they need some time away from you or something, they'll send you to respite care. Um, mm -hmm. it's like so it's respite for them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Not for me. Okay. Right. But yeah. Huh. Um, and I came out, I, I didn't cut my hair um, during this respite thing, but then I came back because I thought that was an unconditional, you know, relationship with this foster parent um, but when I cut my hair off and tried to see if she would accept it uh, she didn't mm -hmm. and I lost that relationship I, I suppose but it wasn't that close so and yet to have your own real identity sounds to me like the thread that ran through all of this I mean I hear this from a lot of LGBTQ people not just young people um, that eventually simply to be able to admit who you are and show who you are, that it's more important really than almost anything. Yep. But for foster youth, the experience that what I've heard in many situations is what both of you have expressed so far, which is the, the issue of, you know, who will, who will care for me? Because um, not that we can take our parents for granted anyway, because there's always a lot of us get kicked out when we come out. I didn't. I was lucky, but um, but it, it's like an added thing that would not only keep you in the closet, but also um, a hope that you would be accepted as who you are. Uh, do you have you also worked with other gay and lesbian foster youth? Yes, um, particularly with. California Youth Connection, um, who is in collaboration with the Youth Training Project. Uh -huh. And the Youth Training Project is um, a group of current and former foster youth. And what the Youth Training Project does is um, teach foster youth how to be curriculum developers and how to be facilitators of child welfare trainings. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so with them, I have I built um, with you know a bunch of my colleagues and uh, uh, curriculum. Um, on LGBTQ um, foster youth issues hmm. um, to help child welfare professionals better understand um, the LGBTQ population and how to best serve them. And we were all gay, lesbian, you know, we, we, we fit the LGBTQ acronym. Uh -huh. um, and so I worked with them, but, but wherever I go, um, California Youth Connection, there's gay youth, um, in Alaska, same thing, you know, um, we're everywhere. You can't get rid of us. <laughs> we are everywhere. There's so, no question. Yeah, I definitely work. I, I, I imagine people watching the show are wondering, boy, that sounds great. How would I get such a curriculum? Is that something that was worked through with uh, California Youth Connection or a different organization? How, how would you get that curriculum? Yeah, I mean, somebody saying, well, maybe Jackie, should I ask? I, Either one, mm -hmm. but Jackie, I saw you start to answer the question. I'm gonna let Maggie go answer. ahead. No, Maggie. go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> That's all right, Jackie. It's your turn anyway. <laughs> um, so if, maybe to answer that and then uh, to hear your story as well. But first, I'm just thinking. People are listening to Maggie and saying, "That sounds like a wonderful thing to have." Mm -hmm. You know, in my state, in my city, or whatever. Mm -hmm. how, how would they access such a curriculum? So the Youth Training Project, um, in collaboration with CYC, we were two organizations, but we're kind of sister brother organizations. Um, if they're interested in getting the training, they can actually contact the Youth Training Project, which is the website, just youthtrainingproject.org, um, and actually request a training. Um, CYC, California Youth Connection, also does trainings, but YTP, we're all about acronyms. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I think we'll so. do a crawl under the credits at the end right. of the show. So get your paper and pencil out so that you can write down. You know? So Youth Training Project we call YTP. Um, YTP does, I would say, more intensive, longer trainings. Mm -hmm. CYC a lot of times will be requested to do a workshop at a conference or something of that sort, which CYC will usually do smaller trainings. So um, 
I think the great thing is that there are a lot of trainings available with curriculum written by youth, written by what CYC and YTP consider the experts of the foster care system, mm -hmm. which are the youth that lived it, breathed it, everything of that sort. So tell us a little bit about your background. I mean, it's there's not a million people in the world doing <laughs> the kind of work you're doing. Um, or maybe there are, I don't know. But how? what called to you about this work? How did you get into it? Um, so in college, I was a neuroscience major, and I thought that's what I want to do. Um, neuroscience, how the brain works, mm -hmm. chemistry, that kind of stuff? Kind of thought I was going to be a doctor. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> And during the summertime, I would work at camps um, that were for mothers and their children. The mothers came from either domestic violence shelters, drug and alcohol rehab, or prison. And one day I woke up and said, I could do this the rest of my life. Hmm. So with that in college, um, you know, I was looking for a job and I started working at a youth runaway shelter. And I realized that's the population I really enjoy. That's the age group I really love. I love that kind of 14 to early 20s. You must be one of three people in the universe. <laughs> I love it. anyone the age of 14. You know? <laughs> I loved it. Um, and then through them, we started actually a project called the Youth Empowerment Project. Um, at that time, then I graduated college and I got a job at Orangewood Children's Foundation, where that's where I actually met Teron. Mm -hmm. um, and I ran their independent living program, in which it is a state program um, for foster youth from 16 to 21. Um, and then I just completely fell in love with the youth. And as I learned more about the foster care system, it just, it pulled on my heart. And I also realized these young people are amazing. And I didn't know if a lot of people knew that. Mm -hmm. And so what was great was CYC, California Youth Connection, try not to use too many acronyms. It's a statewide organization. Mm -hmm. And Orangewood Children's Foundation housed the Orange County chapter of CYC. Mm -hmm. So that is where I got involved. And I thought it was the most amazing organization because the raw power of the young people is what drives the organization. And it wasn't the adults. It wasn't the check writers. It wasn't the politicians. It was the young people. And then with that, I just, I fell in love. And that was in 2000 and I'm still involved now. And no regrets, eh? No regrets. So what kinds of things do, do does the organization do when you say... Um, in in terms of what are the what are the verbs that you would use for what uh, the young people in the organization do? Because oh, you've used the word training. So trainings, advocacy. Advocacy to whom? Advocacy to anybody who will listen. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they're not walking along the street and saying, "Excuse me." Some do actually. <laughs> We've actually had some youth that. Yeah. We'll pull anybody, especially if they're fired up. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times to policymakers, legislators, um, caretakers, anybody who may be working with foster youth, and even the general public, mm -hmm. um, the community. Mm -hmm. CYC strives to really change the foster care system. And it can be done on what we believe on three different levels, whether that's policy, you know, changing laws, changing the way things are done in the written, in the books kind of deal, practice. Um, a group home staff can, and the way they talk to a youth, a social worker, and the way they communicate and really interact with a young person. And then attitude. Um, a lot of people have their own personal stereotypes and prejudice and just everything like that. And CYC tries, strives to try to change people's attitudes about foster youth. Well, we changed the law, I remember, a couple of years ago in California about the training of foster parents. And um, it it was it's like a small step so that mm -hmm. because we had we we had had some information and testimony mm -hmm. that there were some families that said you know i don't want one of those mm -hmm. in terms of gay and lesbian youth um so we didn't want that to be the case but here you are all on the kind of you know on the ground what what is your experience in terms of seeing how gay and lesbian youth are treated, have been treated um, as they come through your program? You know, I definitely feel like it's there's a wide spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, the past couple of years, there has been a, a push for educating foster parents or group home staff or caregivers in working with LGBTQ youth. Um, and in the passage of several laws and to, and to support young people not to be um, judged or discriminated 
in regards to their sexual orientation or religion or anything of that sort. There has been a huge. But I also believe that it's it's a spectrum in which we've moved a little bit this way and there's mm -hmm. still so much more to go. Mm -hmm. um, and it also depends on where the youth is placed, the resources available, the community that is available. There's no um, cookie cutter story. It's not like you can put, you know, John Smith in one place and then by the time he gets out because all these things were in place because that's not how it works. Um, but I do believe there has been great strides, but I believe that there's so much more to go. What would you, if I said to you, what, where's the next piece to go or what would be helpful from the point of view before we start our sort of round discussion, just from your point of view, um, what would help? Oh. That's a loaded question. <laughs> Do you think it is? But, yes, definitely. Not really. <laughs> um, that's to say, not yeah. meant to be. <laughs> I feel like that's. Um, there's so much that can be done. Um, like, like again, it's from policy to practice to attitude. Um, I, I mean, personally, I believe an attitude is a huge thing, um, and but I believe people's attitudes can change through education. Um, so do, uh, well, let me ask you, do uh, foster, let's start with foster families. Are they, uh, so far as you've experienced it and through the young people that you've worked with, do you find any difference in preparation of foster families or anything that, you know, that I don't even know what they, if people know what they have to do. Let's say if you want to be a foster parent, do you, do you go through something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely foster parent trainings through uh -huh. the county. Each county, you know, has their different way of training. Uh -huh. and, so um, it's a county thing, like what they'll have to definitely. do. And um, um, it's a state mandate for how many hours foster parents are trained each year. Um, but again, each county can train on different things. I know in my experience with Orange County, um, I've been involved with the training um, panel and they have former foster youth come in and give their experience. And that's part of their um, training the foster parents on the different experiences of different youth. And they also talk about LGBT issues so that the parents um, are aware of it. And um, if you know they're not prepared or accepting of it, they can process that with them you know, um, and see if it's a fit for them to be a foster parent. And how does a kid get placed with foster parents? Do you, do they, I mean, if, I don't even know that people would know the process. Do they, is it, do they interview you? Do you get to meet them and then people decide or you're? No, I never, it, I never interviewed my foster parent to see if I wanted to go there. It was just like, oh, we're taking you to this foster home. So they tell you where to go. Well, they take you and they drive, they make you wait at the assessment center um, until they find you a placement and then a county worker comes in her car and takes you to the placement. Mm -hmm. um, you don't really have a say in that. You don't really get to interview your foster parent. Um, at least in my experience, I never had that. But I, 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 It may seem like a dumb question, but I often my role is to ask the questions that I think people watching the show are going like, how does that work? Mm -hmm. I know? think they're getting better though. I think they're getting better though, because um, I think as time went on, you know, when I was moving from group home to group home, um, I had an opportunity to check out these group homes, like Glass House. I, I had an opportunity to check it out and say, hey, this is a really nice house, you know? Like, yeah, this is cool, you know? Um, and I hear it a lot in advocacy. Yes, youth should be able to interview their foster parents. Um, so I think it has, been making progress or should have some input into like what they should look for in good foster parents right. mm -hmm. um, and the other thing um, with foster parents the selection process is they have to go through a background check and go through a home inspection and um, get reference mm -hmm. checks um, what am I missing so it's kind of like a six month long process and I'm speaking for Orange County specifically um, and each county does it differently but that is kind of the process for them to kind of weed out the people that they don't feel like will be a good fit and to see if they're appropriate. To so be a you parent. have a, a social worker that works mm -hmm. with each youth theoretically or really? Yes, with their theoretically. High case loads. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have big caseloads. Yeah. So are foster parents prepared like, well, this this child is a lesbian. Are you okay with that? I mean, how does the social worker handle the sexual orientation stuff? Do you know? I, I have no idea. See, well, I wasn't out when I was, a, you know, a, a dependent, so I don't know how um, it would have been with me, but I know even with any special need, I, I think 
to have mental disabilities, physical disabilities. They just talk about it in general beforehand. And if it directly relates to the youth, then that's kind of when they process it with that direct foster parent that they would be placed with. Um, so your impression at least is that foster families are told this child is, you know, is a, is a gay young man. If they're out. If they're out. If they're well, out. of course, that's the case yeah. with your one's own children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. like, I don't know. Yeah. You know. <laughs> but then sometimes I would have to say there are a lot of situations, too, in which there's an emergency placement. They have mm -hmm. to place somebody. A social worker wants right. to go kind of go home at the end mm -hmm. of the day, you know, and... You know, this youth is just sitting at the assessment center and saying, I have no, all their belongings in a black trash bag. And like, I don't know where I'm supposed to go. Mm -hmm. They'll, and I've heard, actually heard it from foster parents and I've heard it from youth in which we got placed there, didn't know any information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the youth is, you know, where am I going? Who's this person? What bed am I in? And then the foster parent is like, you told me it'd be one day, one night you just needed this youth here. And they've been here six months now. So there's, I think, um, you know, I think there it's definitely progress towards definitely having youth voice and input and things of that sort. But there mm -hmm. are still a lot of cases in which young people are just kind of thrown into something and the situation isn't explained, mm -hmm. um, you know. And, and, and some foster parents, they're not given the information. And then as a result, they may kind of not shun the young person, but kind of be removed. And it's just not a good situation mm -hmm. because of both. No, I totally agree. Yeah, wonder what the alternatives are. I mean, I, I, I'm interested in the number of homes that exist, group homes that you have lived in, many of them. I'm interested in this assessment center. This is something I don't think people really know. But, I mean, I'm imagining a situation, let's say, where uh, the cops come to my house and they arrest my mother. It's just sudden. They're not giving us any warning. I'm suddenly needed to be put somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. They take me, is that where I'll go? To an mm -hmm. assessment center? It depends on the county, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of counties will have, they'll call it different names, but assessment centers are usually kind of the general kind of term for it or clearing mm -hmm. houses. And a young person is dropped off there. Mm -hmm. And the the cop usually will be like, all right, here you go. People, so, people here will take care of you. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of walk away and the young person's there com completely confused depending on the age range. But I think even uh, from a two-year-old to 17-year-old is going to be kind of confused. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of take it from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's usually like a county county office building. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. the social services building that you see. In Alameda County, it's um, you walk into these doors and on the left side, I think it's for county workers or, you know, people who are trying to find your case, doing your case stuff, trying to find place in the right side is yeah, just a big living space. It's like a living room and a play space for, you know, little kids. Um, and there's like a little kitchen area in one room and all that stuff, which are locked in there. Um, and you're just watching TV and doing that stuff all day until someone finds you a placement. I, I once stayed in the assessment center for like three days um, until they found me a placement that I wanted to be in. I was like, no, I will not settle for anything except Bay Area Youth Centers, <laughs> which is, you know, the placement that I was, the group home I was first at, where I came out at. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to go back there after my group home tour. Experience. Tour. <laughs> yeah, my tour. group home tour. Right, exactly. my tour of the group home. Right. right. Yeah. Um, so I demanded that I go back there. So I waited three days and they took me back. I was so happy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these centers, you know, a young person, whether whatever age, you're kind of ripped from whatever's happening yeah. and going on, and then you're thrown into something that's very cold. A lot of these places are very cold. It's not, a, you know, no one's there to really sit and explain. And it's just, it's, it's mind-boggling for me, um, working in the field, and and talking to young people and hearing their experiences from, you know, young people being at work and cops coming to their work and saying, "You need to pack up your stuff. You need to go home now." You, or we're taking you right now, not explaining and why is my sibling in the cop car right now and, and all of mm -hmm. that. And it, it it hurts my heart to know that young people and, and children are pulled that way. Nothing explained. And then almost in the, some of the places I've been to, it's almost institutional. It feels like juvenile hall. Mm -hmm. And here we are trying to say we're protecting these young children and we're going to give you a better home. We're going to do all of this. And we actually do... I feel a terrible job in a welcoming, having them feel safe, 
And then as we place many youth in foster care of being a good family as a community where I feel mm -hmm. like we fail them mm -hmm. in raising children. I mean, I'm talking about youth training project. I'm also a trainer with youth training project. And um, we, I feel like we did a good job of bringing that training and the, the youth voice to child welfare workers mm -hmm. for many years. And um, when you talk about what can we do to change things, it's like we need to have youth training project in every county, you know, to train child welfare workers and, and mm -hmm. give the youth voice and give the input on how you feel like they should be trained because they come up with the best practices. Mm -hmm. You know, they come up with what they feel like works with youth. And, um, you know, I definitely think that that could be implemented within each county, you know, just as a part of the training coming from the front end when you're becoming a foster parent and not after the fact. I think we're doing a lot of the preventative work and re the reactive work as youth right, trainers. Right. Um, and we should do some of that, you know, on the front end um, so that foster parents are more prepared. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, they just have a better understanding of the youth that they'll be dealing with as a foster parent or adoptive parent or a kinship provider. And that's why I think why youth training projects, sorry, mm -hmm. acronyms, and um, California Youth Connection are so, you know, well matched. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got um, youth who used to be in care tr out there right into curriculum training, um, caretakers, people working with young people, everything of that sort. And then you have CYC that's empowering the young people to stand up and to mm -hmm. find strength in their voice and to find um, strength in their experiences and use that to fuel change for you know, maybe not only them, but definitely for the generations after them, because mm -hmm. many of these youth will know that you can change a policy this year. It's really not going to happen. You're really not going to see it till around five to 10 years after. Mm -hmm. And so it's a That marriage. would make it even more important for uh, LGBT uh, youth mm -hmm. to participate. Because mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that I was the first out gay or lesbian person ever in the legislature. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like that seat at the table brings a voice. It's not mm -hmm. the only thing you're about because mm -hmm. it's not the only thing about you. But mm -hmm. it was a whole new perspective. And I'm assuming that in the work that you're doing, that that additional perspective mm -hmm. is one that's important in the whole panoply of mm -hmm. training, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, are there other, uh, uh, are there issues that are different really for LGBT uh, kids in foster care? Mm. I don't know, I mean, we kind of didn't say it, but talked about just the safety piece. And because if you can't, if you don't feel safe with your family and then you go to a foster home where you don't feel safe and you don't feel safe in society with, you know, having a stigma against you being gay, then, you know, youth really have to find a place to feel safe. Um, and they have to find safe havens in CYC or YTP um, or other community agencies like the centers that, you know, the gay and lesbian centers in around the counties. Um, I'm actually volunteering in the one in Long Beach. Um, and that's where youth can come. It's like a social group. Um, they can come and just drop in center or hang out. And but they also have the opportunity to process, you know, they're coming out or not coming out because of whatever barriers they have. But um, I think those types of places are good for you to feel safe and to feel like they um, can show their true identity. And do you have to come out as a foster youth? I mean, that concept would sort of be the same. You'd be, you'd go to the center to work, you'd go mm -hmm. to, you know, University of Alaska, et cetera. Mm -hmm. People don't look at you and think, oh, here's a, you know, a kid that's been in the system. I, I, I don't know that there's a stigma, but that's because I've not experienced it. What do you think, Megan? <clears throat> Well, I always come out as a former foster youth because it's it's so much a part of my identity, just like being a lesbian. Um, and so I I always come out um, as foster youth and lesbian because honestly, the the LGBTQ community and the foster youth community both are my family. Mm -hmm. You know, I can depend on them. You know, like I am in solidarity with them. You know, we are fighting for the same thing. We are fighting to be seen as human, you know? Um, and so I always come out as both because I want to relieve the stigma. Um, and the only way that we can do that is to come out like the sign behind you. Right. <laughs> so. Right. It's been instructive and it wasn't, I mean, it's interesting. There's been discrimination on so many bases, but a lot of people don't have the opportunity to hide under some discrimination. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet with sexual orientation, you sort of 
you know, you have to declare who you are, and it's really the same with familial status or, or whatever. What's the response when you tell people, you know, your new friendship networks or whatever, I've been uh, in the foster care system? I, I don't know. I don't, like, <laughs> it's kind of interesting because kind of like what Maggie is saying, it's, it's kind of my family, so those connections that I have, um, most of the people know already that, you know, mm -hmm. I'm from a foster youth, um, and if I they don't know, I don't think they have an issue with it. I haven't experienced mm -hmm. anyone having an issue with it. And then also with me coming out as being gay, I haven't really had much flack from, you know, friends or strangers, just been more like family, just trying to understand you know, why I'm this way. But for the most part, the people I have come in contact with that I have relationships with, they, you know, are people that are accepting and open-minded. So I haven't really had a lot of issues with that. Uh, it's harder, honestly, to come out as a foster youth um, huh. in some ways, because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, is that why you're so challenging? Or, you mm -hmm. know, is that why <laughs> you have challenging behavior, you know? Um, so. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> it's true. Um, so, and even when I say, oh, I'm a group home youth, that's like, even like, what? <laughs> what mm -hmm. is a group home? You know, um, but, you know, I explain to them. And, and that's why I, I do this advocacy work and all this stuff because. You want to give back. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's, as the audience knows from the introductions, you're both uh, in the higher education system. Um, you're getting your master's. That's that's mm -hmm. pretty cool. Master's yeah, in what? I, in social work. So that's why when Maggie was saying it, it's hard to come out because definitely um, working in social services um, and having my master's now um, for a year, I feel like um, I have to be very conscious and cognizant of, you know, my own um, issues. And if it's my own issue when I'm advocating for youth or for a family, um, and um, it could easily be misconstrued by my colleagues as, you know, oh, he's a former foster youth, so that's why he's advocating for that, or mm -hmm. he's had that experience, or that's some counter-transference that he's experiencing now. Um, and um, so, yeah, with that, I don't, I don't always, you know, advocate as much as I would want to because, you know, Still I'm, your experience I'm making sure. Must help you connect. I mean, mm -hmm. to understand. And it doesn't even have to be exactly the same experience. I mean, I mm -hmm. found the same thing with people who had experienced discrimination when, you know, when our community started coming out. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, seen as an act of courage because you could, you know, it was dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, but there was some understanding kind of uh, with people who'd experienced the same thing and who weren't gay. And that was mm -hmm. some of the first coalition connection. But, uh, but Maggie, why Alaska? Seems like a long way to go for school. <laughs> it's it's always been my dream uh -huh. to go to Alaska for any reason, um, and just and just get out of my comfort zone, which is the Bay Area. I you know that is my home, and go somewhere where I have always dreamed to go. Never knew how I was going to get to Alaska, but the dream was enough and. And I made a speech with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I made a press conference with Arnold Schwarzenegger and someone saw me and saw my biography and said, saw that it, I wanted to go to Alaska. And uh, she was like, oh, I know of a group facing foster care in Alaska. I'll just send you up there and check it out. And I found out, oh, you can get into you know, the University of Alaska Anchorage with you know your GED. You just got to take a placement test. Uh -huh. And I was just like, oh, that's it. That's my way to Alaska, you know? And so... I followed my dream to Alaska um, and I got out of my comfort zone and I wanted to be really accepted for who I am no matter where I went. Um, and I knew that if I stayed in the Bay Area that I wouldn't know what I'm capable of, you know? And so in Alaska, I'm, I really feel like I'm, I'm growing. What's it like? That? What's it like? It's, yeah. <laughs> it's different. Uh, it's less concrete. <laughs> Um, yeah, more nature. I, it's, it's winters are beautiful if you can stand the cold. Um, and they last a long time. Yes. <laughs> I, and, and yes, and <laughs> February is the coldest month and we get about 19 hours of darkness in December or something wow. in Anchorage at least. 
I like it. I, <laughs> I, no, I like the I cold. Loved I loved when I visited. But is there any, do you find a difference in the youth that you've met and work with in Alaska? You know what? I, it's actually Bosch youth culture. It, mm -hmm. It's amazing how everywhere you go, it's kind of the same. Um, and so we, we go through the similar things. Um, even though laws are different and, you know, they do things different, there's a culture there. And there's, you know, and that's how we bond with each other because we've been through um, similar things. Mm -hmm. um, so not much difference. Not hmm. much difference. It's interesting. Do you find the same mm -hmm. thing? Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure the same trends of issues, just not dealing with the grief and loss, um, you know, the detachment from the family, which Jackie explained, just, you know, being taken away from your family, not really understanding. I mean, you knew, like, in my experience, I told someone at school, you know, about what was going on at home, and it was just kind of like, you know, innocent kid telling what was going on, but not intending to receive support or help or not asking for help or crying for help, um, but it, that ended up changing my life, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so the youth, you know, sometimes do the same thing or they actually do go for help, but you know, it's still um, more comforting when you know when you're gonna get abused. It's so sad to say this, but like, you know, your your dad gets drunk, he gets, you know, belligerent and you, you can, you know, count that like clockwork. But then when you go to a foster home or group home where you're like, everyone's a stranger, you don't know the environment, you don't know what's going to happen. Everything is unknown. It's like, you're kind of more comfortable with having the known, you know, abuse and the known things going on at home. Um, but that's something I don't think that most times, you know, us, you know, social services, you know, coming in to try to save the child and to be the parent for the child don't really understand that piece yet. It, when we were working with uh, battered women in the very early days of the battered women's movement, which is where I had my community organizing experience, um, it was really very much the same. Uh, people would say, well, why doesn't you just leave? And of course, the issue was primarily safety somewhere else, mm -hmm. um, which couldn't be guaranteed, economic support, which you know you weren't sure you were going to get, etc. Uh, too much blaming the victim. But there was this issue about I, the, the devil I know, mm -hmm. which I learned to live with, avoid, you know, reduce the abuse, even though I had to take mm -hmm. it. And they didn't, a lot of times, didn't expect it to escalate, which it did, because mm -hmm. uh, it was never within their own control. Mm -hmm. But there must be, um, there must be a lot of trust issues with oh, yeah. foster youth. I mean, I can imagine it must be very difficult. Yeah. I think with CY, what's great and the reason why, I, you know, another reason I fall in love with CYC is because the organization got started by foster youth and continues to be driven and run by foster youth. And there's a community in CYC um, in which the members, when they come together, which is, I always find, it's my favorite part, um, when all the young people come together, there's an acceptance, there's um, an understanding, there is there's no need to explain mm -hmm. certain things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like Maggie said, like, you know, whether she's here or Alaska, there's, there's, a, it's like you have your own membership card and mm -hmm. that, and it's neat mm -hmm. from my perspective to sit and watch no, it. No, it's true. Cause it's even thinking about when me and Maggie first met, it's like, you know, there's this unwritten rivalry between the Bay area and, and LA, you know, <laughs> LA people are a certain way, are portrayed in stereotypically North a certain way. Right. And North Cal people are, you know, portrayed a certain way. So Maggie's like, okay, you're from farm, former foster youth, you're cool, you're gay, you're cool, we're family. You know, it's like, <laughs> right. no problems. But, you know, other LA people, you know, we can talk about that. But it's so true. Like, we just, we bonded immediately and um, got to know each other. And um, it's true. Like, we didn't, we live 500 or more miles away. And never knew each, each other, but we are like brother and sister now. So yeah, it's cool. So if you were to give advice, I mean, there's a lot of different people watching the show. Um, probably some of them are lesbian or gay or bi or questioning or transgender youth. Uh, if you were to give any advice to young people and or people who are thinking of being foster parents, I mean, I we don't know who's watching. Um, what would you say? Jackie, I'm going to ask you first so that because I see them forming their thoughts. Yeah. I know you probably know what you'd say, but go ahead. Um, 
are you just talking about LGBTQ youth in foster care system or in general or? I don't care. Whatever you want to say that you've learned or that you would like people to learn. There's, I mean, obviously this show is about Definitely. LGBTQ Definitely. kids in foster care and and beyond. But um, it's, it's also about foster care and it's also about LGBTQ Definitely. kids, so. I, would, I guess my thing would be to people that are inquiring about being foster parents um, and is to remember that underneath all the labels that people put on everybody is a true human, human being and, and to really take a look at how you view people before you make the commitment to be a part of a young person's life. Um, that would be my word of advice. And what about LGBT parents? I mean, there must be people, couples, single, you know, single, who are really seriously considering being foster parents. I think if you have the heart and you have the love and you and you want to do it for the right reasons, it's worth the sitting through the trainings. It's worth having to go get your finger printed. It's worth it because there's so many beautiful, beautiful young people out there that just need a good home and need to be loved and accepted for who they are. And if you have the heart and you have the passion, you can you can give up a couple of your Saturdays to sit into a training and- I sleep this night. You know, and, and nights, <laughs> now it's in, you know, depending where you go, um, and do it because truly you will get, the young people, young person will get a lot out of this, but you will get 10 times more than you would ever expect. What would you guys say? To anybody who's watching or to different groups watching? What I would say to LGBTQ people um, is remember your predecessors, you know, like remember those who have died to be proud to be the embodiment of the word gay or lesbian or transgender, transsexual, you know, um, like Gwen Arahu, like Lawrence King, who is a foster youth as well and who died. Um, Matthew Shepard, remember those people and fight as hard as you can because people do not have to be murdered like that. Um, and that's why I fight so hard because I don't want to see another one of my family members, LGBTQ or foster youth, die like that. Um, so you fight <laughs> strong, not you personally, but I, you know. Um, yeah, me personally too. Yeah, well you personally too, of course. <laughs> but. But it is one person and a bunch of people, isn't it, Maggie? Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. Say that again? I'm sorry. I I, just... I'm thinking of what you do as an individual. I'm just listening to sort of your the stories and what we do when we organize. Because mm -hmm. you're really engaged in both, really. I'm not quite sure what you're asking me, but... Well, you said to fight. Yeah. Tell me what that means to you. You come out. You, you do whatever you can. Um, in order to be proud of yourself. Don't let anyone else like tell you, no, you're not supposed to be that. If you feel that that's who you are, then be you. Um, don't be afraid. They weren't afraid. Matthew Shepard wasn't afraid. Gwen wasn't afraid. You shouldn't be afraid, you know, like. Be Sometimes proud. Sometimes people are afraid because they think something will happen. And the, the interesting thing about life experience is it happens. It does. And you're still here. And I'm then you here. do something else with it. So I think that sometimes people are afraid because they, it's like coming out where it seems like it's this brick wall and everybody's going to hate you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you just very tentatively come out to somebody and they didn't hate you. And it turns out to be not as much of a brick wall, you know, because actually sometimes they're even welcoming. Mm -hmm. I'm just waiting for you, you know, outside the closet or whatever. And that's something when you say don't be afraid, even if you are afraid. You, you do it. You do and, it. I, and I remember, you know, writing in my journal even before I, I, I came out where I was, I was just afraid. Like, you know, I wouldn't admit it to myself and all that stuff. Um, and just push yourself to overcome that fear because when you, you know, face your fear, you get stronger. And... Um, and then people start getting scared of you, like, oh, here she is, the new advocate, you know, or, you know, whoever it is. Um, so. 
What would be your advice, Jerome? Well, like you were saying, strength comes with numbers. So, you know, once they come out to that one person, they, can, they you know, have a community they can feel supported with. Um, I think that'll be helpful with youth coming out. Um, but what I would say is kind of speaking to the foster parents, too, is just get to know the youth, you know, get to know them truly, who they are, um, and um, without judgment, you know, because, again, not only is it the fact that, you know, you're treating the youth in a certain way because of their sexual orientation, but you're helping and develop them into being a human being and an adult that is, you know can become a productive citizen or not you know because of the experiences they have with you as a caregiver um so i just always say you know get to know youth with open mind um because i'm like jackie i love the 14 year olds and you know the younger ones i, I just you know i vibe with them but getting to know the youth is the most important thing was there one person that was important in because you've clearly gotten through so far mm. and done beautifully was there a person? Mm. I prayed a lot. Um, <laughs> I prayed a lot. Well, that's, I mean, a, that's a person. Yes, I did. I mean, God, I, I definitely, um, of course, coming from a religious background, being raised in the church, I um, always relied on God and prayed. Um, but initially, it was to pray to get away and to pray that God would take the burden away from me. But um, after I got through that process, it's been more of just thanking God for, you know, giving me the strength to be who I am. And now uh, no one can take away the strength from me and no one can, you know, um, make me feel that I can't be myself ever. And Maggie, in addition to the woman who said, cut off your hair, it sounded like that was a pretty helpful piece. <clears throat> was there a person? Well, there's there's two people. Um, there was a per my, my permanent connection. Um, I don't know how to explain that. It's a foster care word, but permanent connection, someone who will always be there for me. Um, she really made a difference. Um, I don't know if I should say her name or not. I don't know if I should put her on blast or something. Um, well, her name's Kate. And uh, she, I initially met her with Bay Area Youth Centers, but uh, she now works with California Youth Connection. Mm -hmm. um, she introduced me to California Youth Connection. Um, Second person is my mother, my biological mother. Uh, and I didn't have to come out to her. When she saw that my hair was shaved, she was just like, oh, my daughter is a boy. Like, <laughs> And I never had to come out to her. She just kind of knew. Um, mm -hmm. And she has never given up on me, um, I have to say. And so both Kate and my mother, kudos to them. Well, and kudos to you and to all three of you. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. I think it's a very important issue for people to think about. And thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we're gonna have some of the uh, website uh, addresses that you can go to at the end of the show under the credits, which will be just in a minute. Um, and uh, just remember, there are all kinds of people as you walk down the street, as you sit in a restaurant, as you go into the movies, uh, some of them are lesbian, gay, transgender young people. Some of them are former foster youth. But we need to all work together and get used to it. Mm -hmm.